Hi, I'm Brett Stafford and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. The hammer fell hard on vapors in 2015 as provincial governments across Canada began passing new draconian laws intended to strictly regulate the use and sale of vapor products. But while glimmers of hope did emerge in the final weeks of the year, with the Ontario government announcing it would delay key aspects of its new regulatory regime, more on that in a minute, it's hard to overstate the challenges facing vapors as the calendar turns to 2016. One by one, the dominoes fell. British Columbia, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, Ontario, and Quebec all move forward on anti-vaping legislation in 2015. Instead of establishing a new legislative framework specific to vapor products, as was recommended by the Canadian Parliament Standing Committee on Health, the provinces, with the exception of Ontario, all plan to regulate vapor products just like tobacco. Make no mistake, 2015 turned bleak as the war on vaping intensified. Legislatures passed laws that seemed to ignore altogether the health benefits of vaping. Vapors faced a barrage of negative media coverage, promoting questionable scientific studies with findings that appeared to be brazenly biased. 2015 also saw a dramatic increase in the number of people who believe vaping is as harmful or more harmful than smoking, leading to increased disdain from family, friends and co-workers. The onslaught has left many Canadian vapors frustrated and bewildered, wondering why their government would want to take away the only product that has successfully helped them to quit smoking. The government the very individuals that set forth to create healthier choices for Ontarians were making, making it clear that vaping would not be an option for us. They have chosen to give us no healthier choices when it comes to smoking. Canadians are pushing back. In early December, hundreds of well-organized vaping advocates turned out to speak up at a protest in Queen's Park against Bill 45, Ontario's Healthier Choices Act. I watched her become unable to speak. I watched her become unable to get out of bed. I smiled and I assured her that I was okay as she laid there crippled. I watched cancer caused by 50 years of smoking turn me into a man who wished his mother, this woman that I looked up to, this woman that I called every day, turned me into a man who begged for her life to end so she and the rest of us could find peace. On the approaching 10th anniversary of Smoke Free Ontario, the Honourable Topeka de Merla and the Honourable Premier Kathleen Wynne have given Big Tobacco, an industry that causes the death of 37,000 Canadians each year, that produces $1.1 billion in tax revenue for Ontario, essentially a reprieve from Bill 45, a reprieve on the ban of menthol, while at the same time crippling Canada's growing e-cigarette industry by preventing store owners from detailing their products. An industry and a product that's now proved to be the number one smoking cessation device on the planet. I told them that if Bill 45 had been in effect in April of 2014, I would still be smoking. This is exactly the same ignorant and disgusting and destructive bill that will close vape shops and leave hundreds of thousands of smokers still struggling with the horrible and useless patches and pills. The pressure may just be working, at least in Ontario. Following the protest and considerable lobbying effort from the Canadian Vaping Association, the province backed down, announcing on December 16th that it is delaying the January 1st, 2016 start for its ban on the use of e-cigarettes in public spaces, offices and businesses, which also includes vape shops. While it's only a delay, it does provide a glimmer of hope for vapors in Ontario and perhaps across Canada. And there's more good news. On the same day as the Ontario announcement, British Prime Minister David Cameron acknowledged the health benefits of vaping. Will the Prime Minister join me in highlighting the role that e-cigarettes can play in helping people give up tobacco for good? 
Uh, well, certainly as uh, someone who's been through this battle a number of times, eventually uh, relatively successfully, uh, lots of people find different ways of doing it, and clearly for some people, e-cigarettes are successful. I think we do need to be guided uh, by the experts. We should look at the report from Public Health uh, England, but it is promising to see that over a million people are estimated to have used uh, e-cigarettes to help them quit or have replaced smoking with e-cigarettes completely. So I think we should be making clear that this is a very legitimate path for many people to improve their health and therefore the health of the nation. Joining us today by phone to discuss vaping regulations in Canada and the impact of the Ontario delay is Kate Ackerman, well-known vaping advocate and board member of the Electronic Cigarette Trade Association. ECTA represents a variety of different players in the Canadian marketplace and works to set industry standards in order to ensure consumer safety. Kate, thanks for joining us. First, fill us in on what exactly Ontario did this week. So what Ontario has done is say, you know, we're, we're going to go back to the drawing board on the regulations. We're not going to put them into force on the 1st of January. We need to relook at them and revisit them. Is this just a delay or could the province dump the entire legislation? It's really hard to know. It's being, uh, right now the ministry is talking about it as a delay in terms of putting out new regulations. So anytime that a law is passed in Canada, and particularly the laws with electronic cigarettes, there's an overarching law, and then under that there are regulations that will specify which parts of the law will be enforceable and what the different enforcement powers will be. So Kate, can vapors in Ontario now sit back and breathe a sigh of relief? Now is not the time to relax. Take a deep breath of clean air, have a vape, and then get back on the horse because this horse could end up going into a very, very bad direction. When regulations go back into consultation, we don't know where they're going to go. Now is the time really, yes, contact your MPP, make a stink, write a petition, get people to sign the petitions, don't stop. Just getting a little bit of traction doesn't work unless it becomes a forward motion. Can that forward motion carry through from Ontario to the rest of the country? Right now in the rest of the country, because these laws are provincial, and they're not federal, it doesn't mean anything necessarily good. There is a hope that other provinces will look at Ontario and say, hey, you know what? They had a problem with their legislation. Maybe we should take a step back and see if we have a problem with ours as well. It's our hope that they will do that. Well, how likely is that, considering most provinces have already finished the consultation process? There were consultations. Consultations were ignored in British Columbia, in Nova Scotia, in Quebec. Now those same consultations are taking place in Manitoba and in Saskatchewan. And it's really unfortunate when a government stops listening to the people. Kate, why do you think regulators are turning a deaf ear? The regulations are not being made based on science. They're not being made based on medicine. The provinces in Canada are completely ignoring the product and trying to apply regulations for tobacco. Taking a product that has no connection whatsoever to tobacco and placing it entirely in that category automatically demonizes it. And what's the impact of that demonization? The impact is people won't want to use it. It's misinformation from beginning to end. Kate, what kind of a toll does all this take on Canadian vapors? like being hit in the stomach over and over and over again. This has created some uh, very intense feelings amongst people who are vaping, asking their government, why do you want me to go back to smoking? You spent all this time and all this energy telling me that smoking was bad for me, that I shouldn't do it, and now I stop, and you tell me that I can't have the thing that makes me stop. Well, that's it for this edition of Reg Watch. Before you head off, please like us on Facebook and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. For RegulatorWatch.com, I'm Brent Stafford.